Today we are going to look at the Hebrew Scriptures. Before we jump in, if you haven't already, we'd love for you to subscribe to this channel. We're continuing to grow and our goal is to reach 5,000 subscribers by the end of 2022. So if you would like to help us with that goal, tell your friends. Let other Bible nerds out there know about Disciple Dojo. And if you'd like to do more than just tell people about Disciple Dojo or bug them by sharing links on your social media, you can always pick up some Disciple Dojo merchandise and show your Bible nerdery to the entire world. Every sale really helps us out. So check out what we have over at our online store. All right, let's look at this Bible. So I first came across this Bible on my friend Carmen Imes' Facebook page. And lo and behold, Carmen actually wrote a blurb. If you haven't seen our interview here with Carmen, be sure to check it out and go subscribe to her YouTube channel as well because she puts out amazing content. But she posted this on her social media and said she was excited about it when it was being released. And so I just not so subtly hinted, hey, if the publisher wants to send a copy to Disciple Dojo to review, I would be happy to take a look at it. And lo and behold, they did. The publisher saw the comment, got back in touch with me, and said, sure, we'll send you a copy, take a look, and share your thoughts. So that is what I'm doing. So what is the Hebrew Scriptures? Well, let's talk about the Old Testament for just a second. This is the Biblica Hebraica Stuttgartensia, BHS. It is the standard scholarly text of the Hebrew Bible, and this is what most Bible Old Testaments are primarily translated from. This, on the other hand, is the Septuagint. This is the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was done before the time of Jesus, and it was read widely by Jews throughout the Greco-Roman world. Now, the Septuagint also includes a number of books that are not in the Hebrew Old Testament. These are books that became known as the Apocrypha. So there's a few more books in here than are in here. But those books that are in here and not in here are books that were never considered on the same level of scripture as the books that are in here. The other difference between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text, that's what this is typically called, the Hebrew Bible, has to do with the order of the books. The order of the books in the Septuagint is the order of the books, for the most part, that our English Bible Old Testaments follow. And so the books are grouped, the Torah, then the historical books, the wisdom literature, and then the prophets at the end. So that's the order that most Christians are familiar with their Old Testament. But in the Masoretic text, in the Hebrew Bible, the book orders are different. They're grouped into the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. In Hebrew, the word prophets is nevi'im. And the Hebrew word for writings is ketuvim. So Torah, nevi'im, ketuvim. T-N-K. That is the order of books in Jewish Bibles, and sometimes it's known by the acronym Tanakh. So if you're ever shopping in a bookstore, you're in Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, you go to the Judaica section, you look for Hebrew Bibles, you might see a Tanakh. Well, that's what we know as the Old Testament, but in the order of the Hebrew Bible, not the order of the Septuagint. And how you group the books can communicate some things literarily and theologically. It's not a question of which order is right or which order is wrong, because even within traditional book orders, there's still some variation. Because remember, the Bible, the books of the biblical canon, were not compiled at the same time. They were compiled just in the Old Testament alone over a thousand year period. So they were collected centuries before there was even such a thing as what we know of as a book or a codex, they were collected as separate scrolls. So there's no real definitive inspired order that the books have to be read in, and different communities have read them in different orders. There's a logic to the order of the Septuagint. They weren't just throwing stuff together haphazardly. It makes sense. But so does the order of the books in the Hebrew Bible. And that's what the Hebrew Scriptures intends to bring out for Christians who aren't used to reading the books in that order. The other purpose was to give Christians a reading experience of the Hebrew Scriptures, something unimpeded by a lot of notes or marks on the page or even verse numbers in between each verse. They wanted to present the Hebrew Scriptures similar to how other ancient works of literature are read today. So with that being said, let's take a look at what you're going to find in the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, it comes with this not quite full dust jacket, although it is better than the Net Bible Full Notes Edition. We're going to slide that off. Now, the Hebrew Scriptures is 1,593 pages. It is hardback with this kind of blue covered cloth binding with gold imprint, and there are no maps in the back. There are no illustrations, there are no charts, there are no graphs. Actually, I think there was a small chart in the introduction to the book of Judges. And instead, you just have the text laid out in single column format. 
They do include chapter numbers, but they do not include verse numbers. However, within each chapter, they do number the lines on the page. So every 10 lines is marked in the margin. But these aren't the verse numbers. These are the line numbers on the page. Poetry sections are laid out according to the poetry structure of the Hebrew text. And the translation is the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. Preface explains the importance of the Hebrew order in reading the books and how that shapes our theological understanding, as well as noting why the publishers chose the CSB, and a disclaimer that the views of the contributors are not necessarily the views of Lifeway Christian Resources, which is who owns the CSB translation. Throughout, the Hebrew scriptures is abbreviated as HS. That can get a little confusing sometimes, just if you're a Christian who's used to seeing HS as shorthand for the Holy Spirit. I think if they had used HB, Hebrew Bible, that might have been a little less confusing, but regardless, in context, you can make sense of what they're saying. And so they note in the preface, For years we have taught the Old Testament based on its traditional Hebraic order and have longed for an English translation that does just that. So here you have it. We believe strongly that reading the Hebrew scriptures in this order and in this presentation will facilitate a profound reading and will draw you into the journey of the Israelites as they came to learn the nature of Yahweh. We hope that you will come to a better understanding of how this strange and wonderful literature in its own unique way helps us to better know and understand God. We believe that the difficulties of the Old Testament may be a little easier to understand as you revisit these texts and allow the introductions to function as your personal tour guide. And so the only material that you're going to find other than the text of the CSB are the introductions to each section and the introductions to each book. So then on page one, you have an introduction to the Hebrew scriptures and canon. This is by Stephen Dempster, and it's a four-page essay discussing why the order of the books and how we read them matters. And so he gives a number of examples, but here's one I found particularly interesting. On page three, he says, a definite eschatological component is often overlooked, even what might be considered a messianic hermeneutic. The first book, Genesis, which begins with the creation of Adam, is organized in the form of genealogies, leading to the blessing of a descendant from the tribe of Judah, to whom will be the obedience of the nations. This is resoundingly echoed in the last book, Chronicles, which begins with the genealogy of Adam, leading up to the history of David and his line from the tribe of Judah. This evokes images from the previous storyline of a Davidic ruler who will rule the world with peace and justice on the basis of the Davidic covenant. Also, at the end of the first book, Joseph predicts that God will surely visit the Israelites in Egypt and bring them up out of the land. At the end of the last book, Cyrus announces that Yahweh has visited him or appointed to enable the exiles to go up from Babylon to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Thus, the first book ends with a note of an anticipated exodus from Egypt, and the last one ends with a similar note of exodus from Babylon. The question is left open. From which of these exiles will be the Davidic descendant to lead this new and greater exodus and rebuild the temple? So that's just one example of some of the interesting connections that are made when the books of the Old Testament are read in their Hebrew order as opposed to the order we're more familiar with. And again, it's not a question of which order is right. It's a question of how does reading the books in any particular order inform, shape, and color how we read the entirety of Scripture and the overall meta narrative. Now, for an overview of the Old Testament's meta narrative, if you haven't already, check out the video here on the channel, The Old Testament in Under an Hour. We walk through the big picture storyline as it's traditionally presented in English Bible. But when read in the Hebrew order, different things pop out. Then on page seven, we have an introduction to the Torah. This is written by John Golden Gay, and it's a little over three and a half pages long. And then after that come the specific books. And all of the book introductions give an outline of the book, and then they give a list of suggested resources if you want to go further in studying that particular section or that particular book. Then on page 285, you come to the next section, the Nevi'im, the prophets. There's an introduction to the prophets by Beth Stovel. Stovel. A lot of these names I've only seen in print. I've never actually heard them spoken, so apologies if you're a contributor and I mispronounce your name. It's probably going to happen. And then after that introduction, you have the first of the prophets, Joshua. Now, if you're an English Old Testament reader, you're thinking, wait, Joshua's not a prophet. That's a historical book. In the Hebrew Bible, a lot of the historical books are classified as the former prophets. Joshua, Judges, 
Samuel, Kings. Then you have what we know of and traditionally think of as the prophets. You have the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And then what we call the minor prophets in the Hebrew Bible is the book of the 12. And the order in the Hebrew Bible of the minor prophets themselves is a little bit different, not dramatically different, but a little bit different. Then on page 1017, you come to the third and final section of the Hebrew scriptures, which is the writings, the Ketuvim. There's an introduction by Joshua Stewart, and then you have the books in the writings, Psalms, Job, Proverbs. Then you have the five books of the Megalot, those smaller books in the Old Testament that are read in conjunction with different Jewish holidays throughout the year. And then you have the book of Ezra Nehemiah. Those are two books in English Bibles, but they are one combined book in the Hebrew Bible. And then lastly come First and Second Chronicles, which are one book in the Hebrew Bible, just like First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings were. Most likely because those books are fairly long, and when they were being written in Greek, it takes a lot more space on the page to write in Greek than it does in Hebrew. Greek has vowels. So vowels literally double the size of your written text. So some of the books that would have been prohibitively long when written out in Greek were broken up into multiple volumes. Personally, I found the Torah book introductions to be good. Certainly nothing wrong with them. But the introductions in the prophets and in the writings were outstanding. I want to note in particular, A. Lauren Brown's introductions to the books of Hosea and Obadiah, fantastic. The introductions to Micah and Nahum or Nahum by Andrew King, really, really good. Myrdo Theocarus, Theocarus is a Greek name, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing it. Her introduction to Habakkuk was one of the best I've ever read. And then Jason Derushi, Derushi. Darucci. These names of contributors are just tongue twisters if you've never heard them spoken. Again, I apologize. But to make up for me mangling your name, let me just say your book introduction to Zephaniah was fantastic. And then in the writings, the Psalms introduction by Nancy DeClasey Walford. DeClasey? DeClasey? I'll write it on the screen. You can tell me how to pronounce it in the comment section below. A great introduction to the Psalms. Richard Anthony Purcell's introduction to Ruth was wonderful. Tremper Longman's introduction to the Song of Songs, unsurprisingly, is fantastic. And two of my favorite introductions to any Old Testament books I've ever come across in any study Bible were Russell Meek's introduction to Ecclesiastes, a book that most Christians honestly just skip over, and John Hobbins' introduction to Lamentations, the other book that most Christians just skip over. All of the book introductions were good. The ones I didn't mention, it's not like they were bad. The ones that I specifically mentioned, though, I found to be especially well done. Now, aside from the book introductions and the recommended resources, like I said, there are no study notes in this Bible. And that's by design. It is intended as a reading Bible. It is intended to get you rereading the Old Testament in possibly a new translation, because, you know, the CSB, it's not the most popular translation out there. So for a lot of people, it might be a fresh reading of the text, and also in a new order than you're typically used to. And with that as the goal, removing verse numbers was a great idea. That's something I think Gordon Fee has wanted for decades, is for Bibles to take out the verse numbers, because they they needlessly interrupt the text. Now we have a video here at Disciple Dojo where I share with you my favorite way to digitally study any book of the Bible. If you haven't seen that video, I'll link it in the description below. I encourage you to go check it out if you want to see how I encourage people to study large sections of the Bible or whole books. But when you look at Numbers 1, you see a very similar approach in how they've laid the text out on the page. You have an opening paragraph, then you have a list of names, and it's laid out like a list of names would be, so you're not reading it as if you're reading narrative literature. Then, after the list, it goes right back to narrative. Then, once again, it shifts not to straight list, but to sections that describe descendants of particular tribes ending with the number of that tribe. This is a census. And so it's laid out in a way that makes it look or read like a census. That's helpful. When you're reading the text, having material kind of blocked out in sections where you can see almost like pieces and how they fit together, and you're not just reading block paragraph or each verse is its own line or any of the other ways that traditionally English Bibles have been put together, you get a sense of the type of literature you're reading. Again, see the video I mentioned for more on why that's so important. Another place where it makes a big difference is in the Balaam saga. When you come to the story in Numbers 23 about 
King Balak hiring Balaam or Balaam the prophet to come and curse Israel. Well, that's a story. So it's written in narrative. But when Balaam, Balaam, when he starts to speak, he speaks in poetry because he's giving oracles. And so they have laid that out on the page in a way that you can see the four oracles that Balaam gives. And visually in your mind, they kind of separate out. So it doesn't just get lost in a jumble of text on a page. I'll show you a couple other places where the page layout really affects how you read a passage. Psalm 119, the entire Psalm, it's the longest chapter in the Bible. If you only read traditional English translations, you may miss the fact that Psalm 119 is an acrostic. Every section of the Psalm begins with the same letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Now, there's no way to preserve that in English. I mean, we don't even have some of the letters in English that Hebrew has. But the layout at Psalm 119 in the Hebrew scriptures separates each block of material and then puts the Hebrew letter that goes with each block of material right there at the beginning. Literally the Hebrew letter itself and then how you say that Hebrew letter. And that's not the only place that does this in the Hebrew Bible. The whole book of Lamentations is structured acrostically. When you come to Song of Songs, the Song of Songs is a confusing poem. And part of the confusion is because you don't always know who's speaking when. So in the CSB, the translators have tried to aid you in noting which speaker is speaking at which time. So you have the woman, you have the man, you have the young women. Now there is debate within the song in certain passages. Sometimes it's unclear whether it's the woman, whether it's the man, whether it's the young women, whether it's another speaker entirely. Sometimes it's unclear because of the nature of a song. It's poetry, it's lyric. But even if there's question about who exactly is speaking, and that's where you have to actually study the book Seeing it laid out in verse, in, in like, like if you opened a CD cover and saw the lyrics to the songs. Kids, back before you could download or stream music, you used to have to buy it on these plastic discs. Anyway, ask your parents or grandparents about that. It's, it's laid out like song lyrics because the Song of Songs is the song of all songs. That's what the title means, the songiest song, the greatest song ever. So preserving the poetry of it, the way the Hebrew scriptures does, really does justice to the book. And then one more place where the layout is done especially well is at the beginning of Ezra. When you have a list of all of the people, not just the people returning, but you have a letter that has been sent, a royal edict, well, that's preserved in its own little indented paragraph form, Cyrus's decree. Then you have the items, the implements, the list of treasure that was sent back, and that's preserved in a little list right there at the end of chapter one. And then you have the number of the people who returned, the census of the exiles coming back. And they're laid out like we're used to seeing lists laid out in English. So we know we are reading a list. We're not reading nail-biting, page-turning narrative. And then the genealogical sections that deal with like different lines within a family and then jumping to another line and another family, even that they're indented in ways that help you keep straight in your mind what's going on. So hopefully that helps you see a little bit better what the Hebrew scriptures is. Let me give my honest thoughts. So let's get the criticisms out of the way up front. First of all, this is about the least Jewish Hebrew cover design you could have put together. Everything about this screams Gentile and New Testament. So if you're trying to get people to reconnect with the Hebrew Bible. Visually, this isn't doing it. It's, it's well done. It's not a matter of craftsmanship. It's just the design doesn't match the content. There are so many other designs, so many other symbols that symbolize the Hebrew scriptures that they could have gone with, like an olive tree or a dove or a mountain or Torah scrolls or stone tablets. I mean, just visually, you could not get less Jewish than this layout. The second thing is you need to note for a reading Bible, it's a little unwieldy. I mean, it's a little heavy, but it's not large print. So it's kind of the size of what you would expect in a large print Bible, but the print itself is not especially large. It's not small, it's not tiny print, but it's just not large print. So it's this is a little cumbersome. This is not something you would just throw in your backpack if you're gonna go on a hike up a mountain to read the Bible, right? This is a little hard to fit in your purse to take to a coffee shop. I mean, part of it's the nature of publishing the Old Testament. The Hebrew scriptures are a large collection of books, but I would like to have seen it a little smaller than this. And then lastly, I don't know how I feel about numbering the lines on the page, honestly. If somebody is going to be referencing a passage in a book, they'll say, turn to Ezekiel chapter 25, verse whatever, or they'll just say, turn to Ezekiel 25. I don't see any use for Ezekiel 25, line 10. 
unless this became a widespread resource that was used across the board by a lot of people, that way of referencing the text on the page, it just seems unhelpful. I can't imagine a context in which somebody would say, no, no, look at line 13. That's what I'm talking, you know, like you would just say, turn to this chapter and it's this passage. See where it says this and then you just say what it says. So that feature, I, I personally, I don't see the use in it. If you could think of a great use for it or if the publisher's watching and you wanna clarify how those line numbers are being used by people or at least are intended to be, I'd love to hear it in the comment section. It just seems unnecessary to me. And then lastly, it's not really a con, it's just kind of a, eh. the introductions to Torah and the books of the Torah, I thought were the weakest part of this Bible. Now, part of it is John Golden Gay's introductions to Torah and to Daniel. He operates from much more of a, mainline documentary approach than I think is warranted by the text. But that's also the default approach that a number of Old Testament scholars operate from. So it's not like I'm saying, ah, this is bad because he's, you know, suggesting that Daniel was written as if it was prophecy, even though it was written after the events that happened or whatever. Without getting into that, those introductions, they just, they were kind of lackluster, especially compared to the other introductions. And that's the biggest pro of the Hebrew scriptures. Pros, the book introductions, for the most part, with a couple of exceptions, head and shoulders above anything I've read in terms of biblical book introductions. They focus on the literary aspect and how to read the text, what to look for thematically, and particularly where it really shines is showing how the order of the books in the Hebrew scriptures brings out theological points that you may have missed if you only read them in the English Old Testament Bible order. I really can't say enough good things about the vast majority of the introductions that are in this. Kudos to the editors for putting together the team of scholars they put together. They're scholars from a range of different theological perspectives. Also, the recommended resources that are included after each introduction. Very good. I scanned each one, and a number of the commentaries that they listed are sitting right here on my shelf, and are commentaries I would have recommended and have recommended to people throughout the past 20 years of teaching the Bible. And then lastly, the page layout. I love the page layout. You know, the whole numbering the lines thing, eh, big deal. Just the way they presented the text, whatever you think about the CSB as a translation. And let me just say, I like the CSB as a translation. I think I liked the HCSB a little bit more, at least in the places where I've compared the two, but the changes are relatively minor. They are, for the most part, the same translation. CSB is a great translation. It's owned by the Southern Baptist Convention. It's owned by Lifeway Resources, so it's not a mainline translation, but it's a good English Bible translation. I think it's as good as any other out there. If you follow this channel, you know that I don't think there's one best translation, but the CSB would definitely be in my list of top five or ten. And the way they've laid it out makes intuitive sense and lets you read the text a lot easier and to visually understand what you're reading. And that, I think, is the biggest strength of the Hebrew Scriptures. So, would Disciple Dojo recommend the Hebrew Scriptures? Yes, I actually would. This is a great resource. It's a resource for reading, not study, but I think it would be great to sit in your reading nook, by your nightstand, wherever it is you do your reading, have it there so that you can take a fresh look at the Old Testament. So yeah, do I have a few criticisms? Sure, but they're outweighed by the benefit that I think this is. So I do recommend it. If you get a chance, pick up a copy, let me know what you think. Again, sorry for any of the names that I butchered, including the name of the publisher, Mac Macahan, Mac Macahan, McCahan, McCahan. You're killing me with these names. But name butchering aside, great resource. Thumbs up from Disciple Dojo. Thanks again for watching. And if there's a Bible you'd like to see reviewed, feel free to send it to me. I'm happy to take a look. See you next time.